Okay, well, welcome to the panel on, you know, we're going to do this, is the Hernandez brothers who probably need no introduction. My name is Bill Boishell. I run Clipset Comics in Pittsburgh, and a longtime reader of Love and Rockets. Um, and today, because this is, SPX is the 40th anniversary of Fanographics, and there's some focus on that, and basically, you know, Jaime and Gilbert have been like the flagship creators of Fanographics for the almost the entirety of their history. I mean, Fanographics is 40 years old, but for 34 of those 40 years, they've been publishing Love and Rockets. And what we know as Fanographics books is primarily come in the wake of their, you know, Gary's decision to publish Love and Rockets. Before that, they were known for publishing, the, you know, as journalism and reprints. You know, they did the Congress Journal, Amazing Heroes, and Prince Valiant, but then, when Love and Rockets came on the scene, you know, Fanographics became what it is today because of that one single moment. And so I think I, you know, we're going to sort of trace a little bit of the Hernandez brothers and Fanographics today, and um, and we'll see what happens. But I would like to open it up, start here with the you know the decision in the moment when you guys self-published Love and Rockets, and then you know decided to send it to Fanographics. And one of my other question, one of my first questions is, did you send it to anybody else? I, I, do you remember us sending it to anybody else? I don't think so. I don't think so. We 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 we, we wanted to make a comic. We just, uh, you know, fanzine, and uh, we just thought that was the only way to get our stuff noticed. We didn't want to draw Spider-Man or Superman or whatever that kind of thing. We wanted to do our own thing, because we're still in the punk scene, and you just did DIY. You did it yourself. So we did that, and uh, I just we just. Because we're, we're sending uh, spot illos to the Bios Guide and the Comics Journal, right. but we just got the itch to do comics, and so anyway, we published our, our own little uh, book. And uh, I just like that. I just like since, I, like I said, I was we were in the punk scene. That I liked that the Comics Journal was just so nasty. You know, just so mean. I mean, I didn't agree with them, but I just liked how they just were just. They didn't give a shit, and I thought, well, if we could take their crap, you know, maybe. And so I was looking, actually, I c we couldn't afford an ad for Lone Rockets, so I, I sent it to them to review. Right, <laughs> you know, right, like, I do it was a free that. ad right there. Uh, luckily, um, Gary looked at it, and Kim, I guess, and they just, they just liked it. And they, it was just perfect timing, because they were thinking about uh, publishing new new comics, but they didn't know where they were going to grab those, you know. there was. Uh, at the same time, they, there was a Don Rosa's uh, comics, book, comics, well, yeah. and you know, but they were just looking for different things. And it was basically because Gary wanted to crush his enemies. He wanted to crush Marvel and DC, <laughs> which is a good thing, especially back then. Those comics sucked so bad at that time that it had to happen. Like, Lemon Rockets had to happen, and the uh, indie scene that we have now, it had to happen, because it was just so awful. And uh, there was just nowhere to get your comics out, nowhere to get uh, personal comics out. So anyway, so Gary just said, let's let's do it, and we just said, yeah, you know, okay. You know? So how, I mean, again, because everybody here, we live in an era of like text messaging and, and mm -hmm. emails, but back then, like you actually put it in an envelope and physically mailed it to them, so how did you hear back from Gary? Did you get a letter? <laughs> yeah, you know, it took, what, about a month or, or yeah, something? Yeah, a little while. That's yeah. for fan graphics, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was those days where you sent off mail and then you went back to your life because you weren't going to hear for like a couple of months or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, and, and I just remember when we got the letter, uh, it was kind of like, oh, they want to publish us? Well, uh, and looking at the stacks of unsold <laughs> comics, and just like, uh, okay, what do you guys think? Uh, okay, uh, listen. Up. I don't know. Your hands in your pocket. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And so then, did you guys then write them back a letter? Did you make a phone call? Um, I, mean, I think like, uh, some, how that somehow the negotiations uh, occurred. Somehow it was a phone call. Uh, I guess I wrote another letter, and there was a uh, put our phone number on it, and Gary. And Gary called us up once. I, I, I talked to him on the phone, and he just basically said, "Oh, I really like your comics. I like because he liked the influences. He could see Ditko, yeah, yeah, Kirby exactly, and, right, and sure, all these people right. in it. And he just thought this is pretty cool. Let's let's, let's do this, you know. And, and I, I was just like, Duh. it was just too easy, you know, because right. uh, we didn't have a frame of reference of what you know what was going to work, what wasn't going to work. We just thought let's just do it. I have nothing else going on in my life. <laughs> right. I mean, at the time, I had to find a job, and I thought, well, maybe I can make a money, you know, living making comics. Well, eh, never mind. But uh, that was it. Uh, and, you know, so, and then we met Gary at a, uh, 
I mean, we did more pages. I don't know where he had this crazy idea that we could, were capable of doing a 64-page comic, but uh, good, you know, it, it worked out. We, we added pages to what we already had, and then we met him at a, a local uh, convention in LA. And the thing that struck us, so well, before that, I have to name drop here. It was like we kept looking, uh, you know, uh, for uh, Gary, and we didn't know quite what he looked like. So you know, we we, we stopped Harvey Kurtzman in the hall. He goes, do you know Gary Groff? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I go, do you know where he is? And he goes, yeah, sure, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll be good with him. Right. <laughs> that was the only way, because you knew, knew who he was. Yeah, right. and, 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 the, and the guys that, uh, this might have been a different convention, but I don't know if it was the, the, the elevator. Same. Yeah, the elevator. We get in the elevator, and we don't know what's going on, and Bob Clampett comes in. Bob Clampett is one of the <laughs> funniest animators of all time, you know, Bugs Bunny cartoons. Right. And he comes in with his wife, and he's, he's smiling, because he knows we kind of recognize him. Because you could recognize him, because he was 75 years old, but he had a mo haircut, a mo wig. Right. And uh, and then and Joe Schuster, co-creator of Superman, gets in the elevator, and he's half blind. The poor guy. And he's this little guy, and you can smell the mothballs on his coat, and, you know. <laughs> but it was more like this is fucking Joe Schuster, you know. Like, oh, we're like, whoa, and Bob Clampett, and Joe Schuster's kind of looking around, sitting, sitting, and and Bob Clampett. This was really sweet. He goes, "Hi, Joe, how you doing?" He goes, "Hey, Bob, when do we eat?" <laughs> <laughs> And, and Clampett just goes, come with us. We're gonna go. We're gonna go get something to eat. So it was the cutest thing seeing the, 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 the three of them walk off. Little tiny Joe Schuster and tall Bob Clampett, his wife. And, and even then, it was kind of like, wow. I guess this is what comics are about, you know. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't those days. They were around. All these guys were around. And uh, so anyway, we go meet Gary. I go, how old is this guy? Twelve? <laughs> I mean, Gary's you know like sixty-one. And he still looks like he's twelve. So it's um, it's 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 funny. And then we talk to him and. Wally Wood had just died, oh, right. so that was just had this weird vibe in the uh, con. But uh, it was just weird to be at a convention and people talking about legends like you know Wally Wood and you know, like I said, Harvey Kurtzman giving us directions and you know it was just surreal to us. But luckily we were arrogant little twits because we were into punk. We were just so things didn't intimidate us. Right. Now when I think back at it, and I go, what an idiot! I don't even think of hanging with those guys or talking to them or anything. You know, it's more like oh, I gotta go talk to Gary. Go, oh, dude, I'm punk. You know, <laughs> but uh, and then we just sat there staring at each other for a long time because we were all just. I, and Gary told me this later. We all just stared at each other at how young we were. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, wow, this is weird. But anyway, that's that's part of the story. I mean, do you remember more? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, what was the question? Well, we were just, we were just, just about, that was like the genesis of, we were just going yeah. to Ground Zero, Love and Rockets, how it was born oh. at Fantagraphics, right. like the moment when, you know, Fantagraphics and you guys, you're, yeah. you're created like the Fantastic Four, you know, joined at hands. And, right. And, I, do, um, I do remember that it was like, Fantagraphics, they're in Connecticut. What's, what's Connecticut like? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we were in Southern California, it was just like, but then they were just like, yeah, well, when did, because then they shortly, I can't remember the exact timeline. I mean, they moved to California right around exactly yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. And so, they I moved. mean, so yeah. that's yet another, you know, the, the whole thing there. Well, I guess yeah. we're just, you know, we'll continue on for that was the moment that it was born. And then, you know, at that point, you know, you guys were sort of it for establishing like what Fanographics, you know, Fanographics vision of what the con, because it was comics experimental, you know, like Don Rosa did two issues mm -hmm. and that didn't kind of gel, but your guys did, and that became basically the identity of what Fanographics was projecting as the new comics that was going to change the world was basically Love and Rockets. And then in your wake, you know, then people, you know, who recognize what you're doing, you know, shortly thereafter, the format that you chose, you know, the original Love and Rockets was a magazine size format. And then they followed that, you know, with Peter Bag's Neat Stuff and then Klaus's had it, Klaus had did Lloyd Llewellyn, which was originally introduced in Love and Rockets number 13, I think, yeah, is the center, you know, intro. So that was how they were already using, you know, Love and Rockets to introduce the next, you know, the next big thing, Dan Clowes, you know. And it was also in the pages of Love and Rockets. And so, I mean, you know, you guys sort of helped, you know, mold a lot of what was going on. I was wondering, did you, were you friends? You know, how did your relationship, how were you come to know, like, Bag and Clowes and the other, you know, at that time? Or did well, you feel like you were all together on a team? We were all in the same boat. We had no place to show our comics. We had, you know, I mean, Bag had already been working in, in stuff. He'd, yeah, he, he actually co-created Punk Magazine right. with Holstrom and a couple exactly. of other guys. And so he was part of that. And Weirdo. Yeah, and, and, then, and then Weirdo was coming out, yeah, so because Raw and Weirdo were before us, right, right before us. So that was already going on. Um, 
But so when we met Bag, and then later Klaus, I mean Klaus, I said Gary was 12, well Dan Klaus was 8. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's really young and just, but, but see we're, we're kind of hip to the punk scene and stuff, so everybody's just kind of, uh, had more of a, a forward thinking, you know, right. like, it wasn't like, because when you met a lot of mainstream guys, they're very resistant to change and music and things like that. Sure. The, it took the mainstream a lot to the 80s uh, to, to get that there's a real world out there, you know? Right. <laughs> they were still stuck in yeah, and, were, and, and yeah, doing right. their own thing. Right. So anyway, so we got along pretty quick. We were just all in the same boat and kind of promoted each other because it was all new and that, that was what was great about it. It was like, uh, and then people started showing up, uh, you know, here and there. And that, that's kind of how it started. We just got along and knew, we still, we still know Bag and Klaus, like we, you know, just met, <laughs> you know? Right. It's, it's funny. Um, and I guess I would, uh, just to, to, you know, just to put like one context thing because we're talking about fan graphics. Like you did have like a brief at the beginning. To, you went briefly and worked for another publisher doing that Mr. X, you know, the Vortex, which it, you know then it gave you uh, some, you know, obviously the experience there was not at all the same of of, <laughs> of what you have with fan graphics. And so that you know cemented. You know, could you talk about how because you thought well we'll try these guys seem like something and then and it wasn't at all the same experience of fanographics and so maybe just d d compare the do you want me to talk about it or do you want to talk <laughs> about, what about mr x fucking disaster yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, you know. it, it, it was uh it was just we got offered to do that comic and and we were kind of like well we can do 11 rockets and then something else you know and and we just kind of i don't know how you thought of it but i just thought okay this is just I got m extra time to work, you know, and and I knew it wasn't Love and Rockets. It wasn't personal, as personal to me. Gilbert was writing it. I was drawing it, um, and it just turned out the publisher was kind of a dick, you know. Right. right. I mean, it was. You know, it was it, 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 yeah. I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell. Yeah. But that's the. I guess because it was. You know, it was a great work, and it was interesting too. Because then out of that, then like Seth was the guy who f mm -hmm. took over after you left, and then yeah, he yeah. went on, you know, become I, I, you know iconic in Canada, mm -hmm. which the publisher was Canadian. But um, you know, the experience being again, you know, not all publishers, are, you know, are, are the same mm -hmm. in their treatment of the creators. Um, okay, uh, and so then I guess the one of the things, we, you know, in terms of what distinguishes, you know, your work and that the, all the subsequent. You know, fan graphics were these sort of set the template for was I think you know you guys are steeped in comics as uh, when you grew up like you had sort of you know every if people are familiar with language development you know language acquisition when you were a child you know what you can automatically learn a language without thinking about it you know you know if you're in a bilingual household you learn both languages and you don't even have to try whereas then when you're after you're 15 years old or something it's really hard to learn a language and so you guys were just steeped in comics you had like all your brothers everybody read comics and so Jaime you got all the you know the, the the previous brothers comics and you just could read such a large variety that you incorporated an innate intuitive understanding of the language of comics that was created you know up during your youth but then you took that language and applied it to creating meaningful personally meaningful stories that you know, had no one had ever seen before, and you know, of the kind of where you were f focusing on, you know, character and 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 personal relationships and change and growth that was anathema to the formulate genre comics that you nonetheless absorbed the language of. You took that and, and re repurposed it, and that sort of became a lot of what Fangraphics was about. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that a, a little bit. Uh, well, from our point of view, it was just we were just making the next type of comic. It wasn't any plan to, you know, we didn't, yeah, I wanted to crush Marvel and DC, but they had caught up with us pretty quickly because they needed to get that kind of attention, so they right. they had to adjust to where indie comics were going. So, um, I to me, it was just the next kind of comics. Like we had the influences of you know from our youth and uh, and you know like our like I said our punk going out to punk shows and stuff. So I never thought of it as anything that far away from changing comics. And like 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 oh, we're now the comics are changing. Now there's going to be in the future this. You know, we we had no idea. You know, it was it, it was always going to be just a part of comics because there was just no no um, uh, nothing in sight that would that showed that Marvel and DC were going to move out of the way. You know, it just right. wasn't, I mean, we, we hoped, we wanted to have a bigger, you know, thing. But I, I couldn't, I mean, I could tell you, but I don't know how it just was just making, waking up the next day and doing more comics. 
<laughs> really, that's how it's always been. Right, but I guess I guess like you said, you you know touched on the whole punk thing. It's like you could just felt like you didn't have to worry. You would just do what you wanted to do, and you didn't care. And then that was what it, you know, and that was the kismet with you with Gary because he was like, I don't care. I just wanted to do. And so you guys were well matched, I think. Yeah. Uh, and and setting yeah. things forward. Um, okay, I guess something else to talk about because you know you've been with you know Love and Rockets. You know has been now it's coming to it's like I guess fourth iteration coming up any day now and then of course then there was the hiatus where you both worked on your you know solo projects in between love and rockets volume one and one two and it, you know there's been a lot of thought and you know approach to formats like when you started out one of the things that was decided was to do you know the magazine format then do you have any inkling that that decision was connected to that was the format that you would draw on the pages for your own self-published love and rockets one was that then fait accompli that's why the format was magazine going forward or was, did you know did gary have any say in that because the don roses was also a magazine size yeah. just differentiate it from the marvel and dc was that part of it um i think that was gary's plan i i just have always just wanted to do the work you know um they 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 follow the market how it goes it changes because of the market you know what's gonna keep us afloat you know keep us from going under, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I've, oh, I've always only uh, really concentrated on the inside of it, on the inside. And so like the format decisions, the shifts throughout were mostly from fan graphics, and then you just said, okay, I'll do this, and then you just recalibrate and work yeah. according to the, you know, you look at the, yeah, the format. And, and, and eventually I told them, uh, you can do what you want, just leave the insides alone. <laughs> just let me do <laughs> let me do my work and then you guys can package this how, how it goes right because it's interesting because you know the, the ratios you have worked in three distinct different ratios which then you know have an impact on how you have to compose and so I mean did you have any I mean I guess for some some part of you presumably wanted to work in a standard comic book format because mm -hmm. that was what you know you most of yeah. your reading was um, um well uh, the only uh, uh, successful comics, in, uh, you know, up to up to that time, were uh, underground comics that were in black and white comic book size. Right. But every other comics were magazine size if they were in black and white. Right. You know, the, uh, in the '60s, uh, right. but preceded underground comics were um, hot rod cartoons. Right. If you look at old uh, hot rod cartoons or drag cartoons or cycle tunes, that they, they look very underground, very uh, indie. Right. You know, and some of the artists had that mentality, so. Even though they're, 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 the subjects are cars and you know motorcycles and sometimes you know sex, um, we'd grew, grow, grown up with that. So that was the norm. You had comic books in color, whatever, and then you had these magazines. And you're like the first time I saw Wonder Warthog was in a magazine, right? You know, uh, and and then later on Marvel uh, or, or then the Warren uh, books were yeah. like uh, Creepy and Eerie, which we loved. We loved, but they were in black and white, and there were like magazine size. Um, so that wasn't that odd to go shift to little comic books and then to magazines. So anyway, I think that was an And then, uh, uh, like, Savage Sword of Conan in the, in the 70s was, uh, was a magazine in black and white. Right. So I think that was the, the reason to have uh, that. So that signaled that, well, the black and white magazine uh, books are more for adults. Right. Or, or you know, for yeah. older readers. Older readers, right. I'd say. More sophisticated. Yes, right. Well, that was the illusion anyway. Right. Um, so I think that's where Love and Rockets came in as a magazine because it would be like, well, right, already the retailers and the you know the distributors see, oh, it's magazine, black and white. Then this is for an older no. readership. Um, I think that was part of it, you know, because Gary was always thinking about marketing at the same time, you know, like how how this is going to be accepted right away. What accepted, what, what Love and Rockets was really accepted in the in the first at the very beginning is that the decisions of uh, the, the covers that Hyman decided to do. Um, I, I worked with him a little bit on the first cover of Love and Rockets, you know, the, the, the idea more or less. I mean, it's his cover, but I kind of threw some ideas for it. And that, the impact of that first Love and Rockets cover was immense because normally a black and white magazine comic was just ignored at the time um, if it wasn't from Marvel or DC or Marvel, actually only Marvel. And, uh, and then he did the second one with a dinosaur on the cover and that there you go, right away, being a giant dinosaur. You know, the weird little iconic imagery <laughs> really grabs the eye, especially in those days. So anyway, that was really what got Love and Rockets noticed for people that want to look inside and look inside. It was the covers that really grabbed. So we always tried to make covers that were like that iconic imagery. And then once Love and Rockets caught on, we could loosen up and do whatever we wanted. 
Okay. And um, I guess another thing you know, throughout the history, again, since you have such a long career, that the arc of your approach to producing comics is contains within just your work the arc of the entire industry in that initially you were doing serial publication in comics and then that gradually became, you know, de facto graphic novels in the making and then at some point, you know, like you're consciously, you know, in the layer work, you know that it's going to be like collected as a book and you're thinking, you know, so it could, you know, want to talk about all about like the shift of the perception of like doing a monthly, or not a monthly, but a serially, regularly published comic book and the kind of thoughts about how you're approaching, you know, the work towards knowing that it's going to be a book and it would, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. It, there's different I, think, I think uh, you were the first one to start thinking ahead, like, this is eventually going to be collected. So you started to uh, do do stories that were going to lead up to 100 pages to be collected later, right? Yeah, that was because um, Kim Thompson was, uh, is from Denmark, so he was exposed more to European comics when he was growing up. I mean, he liked uh, American comics, but uh, in Europe, they already had the thing of collecting the books into you know, volumes and really nice packages and stuff, and he, he felt that that was a way to put, you know, uh, to reprint the books, reprint, you know, our stories. And, you know, so that way you just don't have another uh, a reprint. You know, uh, uh, Love and Rockets annual that has you know like three issues in it or whatever. They decided to make it books because they really wanted to, to to move away from the, uh, the the comic book market. You know, or at least where comic books were placed in stores and you know magazine places. Um, but yeah, so I think that was Kim Thompson's uh, idea, and Gary was was good 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 with that. So eventually, that became the norm is to have your you know eventually have a book. You know, like a Love Rockets collection, you know, whatever, and then whatever was coming along, to have it a book, you know, with a hardcover or whatever sh the shape of it, and it just, it just, it just screamed for mature readers. You know, it just, it just, right. it well, just did, because yeah. the, the superhero fans just ignored it. They didn't, they didn't want that. You know, and it got into the bookstores. Yeah, obviously. the bookstores and, and, and different and, and different people from different areas were, were you know. Or, or interested yeah, in. Yeah, and then the, the whole thing was, you know, with the comic book store market, you know, there's a, you know, most of you are probably aware, you know, there's the direct market, which is everything that comes from, at this point, one distributor, Diamond Comics, and so the comics in the comic stores all come from Diamond, and so, but then when you go to the bookstore, it can be, you know, much wider in a variety, and of course, different clientele will shop at a bookstore and then discover comics as opposed to people who go to comic stores who only are there for comics and won't, you know, already kind of know what they're looking for. Whereas if you're in a bookstore and also ultimately now Amazon as well, you just, you know, you run across things that you weren't, didn't know you were looking for and that by putting, you know, that really has radically, you know, transformed the entire comic market by having it also be book form as opposed to just a comic book form. And, and again, like, you, you know, you guys work you know, sort of near, even when they were first collected, at first it was just like, you know, the first Love and Rockets collections were just like, were like kind of like the annuals, just putting them together. And then they, and then they realized like, oh, we, you know, we're going to view these as a coherent single work, like a, you know, like, like, a, like a novel and the graphic novel. And then that template of collecting the issues into novel, like then Marvel and D, now it's the norm. Like that's Marvel and DC completely followed you know what you you know that that and yeah. has become the industry norm now i mean a lot of them yeah. you know now it's like everything that's published is like they envision you know it's the book and then the issues are the five chapters published ahead of time oh, oh and dc loves to take credit for it yeah right right <laughs> <laughs> i work part-time with dc and right. they love to pretend that indies don't exist it's it was all their idea you know all right well yeah, i guess we're <laughs> now you all know otherwise in case anyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um Okay, well, speaking of which, that would be a good seg, because, like, you've worked, I mean, especially Gilbert, you've worked, you know, you've had a long-standing relationship with Dark Horse and a lesser long-standing relationship with, like, specifically Vertigo within and DC, and, and, you know, so you've, you know, because you're, you have a, you know, higher rate of output, you know, so you, you've done these, I mean, how do you feel, you want to talk a little bit about the working, the pros and cons, like the ownership, the relationships, the treatment with, the, you know, like, the, you know, the, you know, the more corporate culture of Dark Horse and, and DC? Uh, other than that, you have a boss. Love Rockets, we don't have a boss. You know, um, I've done 
you know, I, I, I got working with DC at Vertigo uh, through my, my editor, Shelley Bond, who basically had the same rough interests, relative interests, like in music and, uh, and you know, and, and fashion, basically, the way characters dressed and stuff. And we just kind of sort of had a kinship there, and uh, she just wanted, um, she tried, actually, she went for Jaime first, but Jaime's ignored her, so I, uh, I <laughs> so she went for, for me, and I didn't mind, I, I don't mind being second, you know, uh, but, um, <laughs> so anyway, that's how it started, I've known Shelly forever, and, and, I, and she, she's the first person to really encourage me to do a graphic novel that wasn't a collection, and that's what, I did work with Sloth on her, on that, and that was a very difficult book, because I, I had never done anything like that, and it, it was really, to do, you know, 122 pages of a complete story all at once was, was really tough, but it was a learning experience. So f with her, it was fine, but she's still the editor. It's still up, up somebody that has to tell you you can't do something, you know, and I wasn't used to that. So luckily, I've, I've worked with her and, and DC and Dark Horse for long enough to where I'm, I'm used to expecting uh, those kind of roadblocks, right. and whereas before, you know, it's it's tough to, to get through, especially having Love and Rockets as my own thing, you know, or my half, you know. Uh, so anyway, it's it is different. You do have a boss. I uh, the only like superhero comic I wrote uh, was called Birds of Prey, right? And there's a Batman offshoot, Batgirls in it, and this and that. Well, the TV show happened to be on at the same time. There's a really boring TV show based on it. Uh, it was a superhero TV show without any action. So there you go, hit hit show. Um, but and I said, well, the, the star is Huntress, Batman's daughter. And I thought, well, I put Huntress in the comic. They go, oh, you can't put Huntress in the comic. You see, this is the idiocy that you have to put up with uh, working with licensed characters. I go, well, what about this? What about this? Well, you can do this. Well, can I use Robin in it? You know, Batman and Robin. I go, no, but you can use Dick Grayson, his alter ego. <laughs> Okay, and then, um, anyway, so things like that, so I got used to that silliness, you know, uh, so I thought, okay, because Birds of Prey is supposed to be an action comic without, nobody has superpowers, they're all like just tough chicks, and they're going to fight crime and all this stuff, so I came up with the goofiest superhero that they, DC had published, which I loved, named Metamorpho, and stuck, her in, it stuck him in the comic, and they were like, what have you done? But it was too late. <laughs> so I actually, I love Metamorpho, so I thought, well, it's DC, it's a superhero comic, let's get goofy. Uh, the word goofy and fun is evil to the mainstream. You can't have a fun comic. This is literature. So anyway, uh, I, I just, just to, I'm, I, I can go on forever, but it's, it's really, uh, it's a different world, and, but I'm used to it now, because I've, I've worked in, yeah. I just, my daughter and I have just uh, finished a story for, uh, Comic, a new comic called uh, Shade the Changing Girl, oh, right. and there, you know, and uh, we did a three-page story in the back. So it was my daughter's first professional gig, and this and that. And originally, it was supposed to be Saturn Girl from the Legion of Superheroes, right? Mm -hmm. That she read minds. She was going to go shop, thrift store shop, thrift store shopping. That's what the story was about. They go, you can't use Saturn Girl. I go, you guys freaking own Saturn Girl. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, no, because so and so is using her, and he'd be really, really pissed off if you used her. And I go. You guys own Saturn Girl. <laughs> you can have several Saturn Girls, you know, but they, they're so uh, tight-butted over there that I, we just said, okay, well, I, we picked an alien creature that uh, they don't use, and they were going, okay, you could use that alien. Sorry, enough DC and that stuff. Now we'll talk about real comics. <laughs> um, okay, well, I guess, well, Jaime, you have, I, I, I'm trying to think, I have, the, that you've done like illustration work a lot outside mm -hmm. of fan graphics, so that's the, the main. Like, and you had that one thing at the New York Times. I remember that was like the the, the famous story where at first you you turned it down. Which one? The New York Times. Oh yeah. Well, and then yeah. so you did that, and then that was and that was collected in the last issue of Love and Rockets, Volume yeah. Two. Yeah, yeah, Volume Two, <laughs> Issue Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, Number Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and you've done like you know like posters and things of that nature also. So that's sort of like the most of you've almost all your work has been through Fana, except for the most. Uh, yeah, you did I, some. I, you did a couple DC I did covers and I just did a Doom Patrol cover. Yeah, you did a Doom Patrol, cover, yeah, you did and Doom Patrol and cover and you did that one thing for Strange Tales that was really pretty cool. That oh yeah, yeah. Because that was the alternative issue, right? Where they let. Yeah, um, yeah. I do it sometimes, not as often as Gilbert. No, um, you know, uh, doing the illustration work as opposed to 
comic work, like when I was doing New Yorker right. images and stuff like that, I always felt uh, only partly satisfied right. because it was just this image. My my, I was so used to my images having a story behind them. Right. And so, even if it was illustrating a story, <laughs> it still wasn't mine. So I I would just do this image, and I'd go, God, I hope they like it, you know. And they'd right. go, Oh, we love, you know, oh, it's great, great illustration. And I'd go, Are You sure? You know, because because it right. just doesn't it, it doesn't sit with me a hundred percent. I I'm so used to being a storyteller. You know, and and sometimes I think I'm more a storyteller who just happens to know how to draw. You know, and and so when I do that stuff, I kind of get weird. Right, because it's almost like they're like yeah, it's like because your characters when you draw the comics, they're like living, breathing yeah. organisms, and when you're yeah. doing an illustration, it's almost like they're it's dead. You know, they're it's not. Yeah, alive. yeah, it's and like, and you know, I still try my best. Right, right but, but it doesn't I have just, the, like, I just leave with it like. Okay, give me the check. Right. You know, right. and, and <laughs> good, good, got away with that one. Right. <laughs> you know. Now, yeah, how about so. it? You guys have, have done a few collaborations. I mean, especially you. But, you know, where you worked with Peter Bag, and then you just recently worked with you know Darwin Cook and a, and a few others. Um, do you have any thoughts on any of the collaborative process without because you so used to working together? Well, the, okay, they're they're different. Um, yeah, was created by Peter Bag and. Uh, for some reason, they, uh, DC have this policy of where if it's a mainstream comic, that the writer, uh, except unless you're Frank Miller, uh, the writer has to be and the artist have to be two different people. For some reason, they don't. You don't ha get to write and draw your own DC comic. I, I don't know why. Uh, but the, DC, Vertigo, you can. Vertigo, you Vertigo, you can. Yeah, because I'm saying. But DC, yeah. uh, right. you, what they call, is different. It, I don't know what the policy is, but uh, so he wrote it, and they wouldn't let him draw it, and so they asked me to draw it, and that was a good uh, learning experience because diff Peter's stories, as w simple as they s might seem, are very difficult because he's very he he's really loves writing and overwriting. So there's so much captions, so much words, and I go, but this comics for ten year old girls. They don't want to read all this shit. But he, he, it was his his project, and that's what he wanted. So we we kind of had a differences that way. But it was a learning experience to put out a, a monthly comic. It was so hard to just even drawing in that goofy Archie type style. It was hard. It was really. But I learned. You know, I learned. Darwin was the opposite. Um, they asked. Uh, Shelly, my, my, my editor there, she just said, uh, at Vertigo said, um, uh, Darwin, I asked Darwin Cook, who, who, who's, who's the one artist he would like to collaborate with? He goes, and it was you. And I went, okay. And uh, so basically it was like, so do a comic together. I went, okay. So I looked, I, you know, I, I, I'd known Darwin's work, and I looked at it, I go, he doesn't need me. <laughs> this is good, though. He doesn't need me. I don't have to really bust my ass trying to, you know, at, uh, fighting with an artist to get the vision right, you know. But he didn't need me. He already knows, he's an animator. He knows how to tell a story, and animators are fast. So I came up with an idea. I just, I thought, ah, I've kind of run out of ideas for, you know, something new and different, but what, what, what haven't I had in a while? I go, well, I never had a color Paramar comic. I never had, uh, I had done a short story that was in color, but I never had like a long story. So I basically stuck Palomar as a seaside village <laughs> and wrote a story around there with new characters. And uh, he liked the script, Shelley liked the script. And uh, I, I made thumbnails for myself, but I would never give them to him because, you know, artists are prickly and you, you can't tell them what to do. So, I, but I knew that. And so I thought, here's the script, here's a few descriptions if you need, Character designs here they are, and he's you know through emails just saying okay bye, and he just went and did it, <laughs> got the art bag. No, this is perfect, beautiful, you know, because I and, and he I was he was really happy about it because he goes goes he goes because Gilbert's an artist and he knows when to let the art happen right. if somebody else is doing it, and right. I did did know that. He, yeah, but there, there might be other artists out there that I might work with, but don't have his particular skills. You know his way of doing things, but I but I could see. I turned into Stan Lee for a minute. I could see what he his potential because right. that was Stanley's greatest strength was uh, besides his funny dialogue, was his uh, ability to pick artists that would work for a certain project right. or, or a certain writer or whatever. Uh, and anyway, so I put my Stanley thinking camp on and thought this is Darwin can do this without me 
after I gave him the words, he went off. And he did. And he did. It was, it was really good. And I think, yeah, probably like what you said, he re mm -hmm. got that you were, you had, he took this as a sign of respect, the, you yeah. know, the, mm -hmm. the, the he, he gave him and then felt yeah. good. Two, know, that. Yeah. Two of the only times I've ever written, d drawn something for, for writers was one was uh, a couple of pages for Evan Dorkin uh, writing uh, uh, a World's Funnest. Right. And then uh, the other one was Alan Moore writing a four pager for his Tom Strong right. thing. And uh, I took a look at those scripts, man. Well, I had more scripts. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I was like, like, you want me to draw one panel with this whole page long description. I was like, you guys are crazy. In the end it worked out. <laughs> but but I don't know I, I don't know who mainstream artists do that. Yeah. Who work with a writer like that. I I was like, you know, this Alan Moore one was wordless. Right. So why do you need yeah like yeah, the first pages. challenge to him, I'm sure. It was just yeah. like yeah. Right. and I just it just drove me crazy and then that that was the one time I felt sorry for mainstream artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's you know because we're you know, we're getting towards the end. Now, let's talk about your you know the last you know Love and Rockets Volume Four, which is starting okay. going forward. What's what can we expect? What's happening? Same, same old. <laughs> yeah. But is it going to be? What's the? I guess the it's for a, me like as a fan is like what's the publication schedule? How often is it going to come? Uh, well, we're going to try for three times a year, but okay. we're getting old, so it might be two. Okay. You know, we're going to try. We're going to go for it. And but it's basically went back to magazine size. Is that we just were getting less and less uh, happy about doing the uh, the, the the annual. Right. Know, even though it worked at first because you could do real long stories and didn't have to continue them, it just got to be grueling to the point of like, okay, now you know I've got 50 pages here and I've only inspired for 20, right. you know, or, or whatever, you know. It just it just started wearing us and it just started to get boring and, and tedious. Really more just covers to, too now. Yeah, that's another thing. I, I missed. I did a cover. We did a covers every two years. You know, and we miss right, that. Right. And we grew up with the comic books that came out at least at a reasonable pace, you know. Uh, and there's new covers and new, you know. Um, and the original Love and Rockets magazine just worked so fine. It worked so good. We only changed it in the, back then was because, like I said, you have to shift with the market. And people were just No, I know. Because well, you can get those. Those could go all on Amazon yeah. and the bookstores because they had a spot. Yeah, yeah, but, so. yeah the, the yeah. comic book thing, yeah. it, the, the comic book in the comic box became the most important thing at that time. So right. we kind of yeah. bent toward that. But anyway. I, I like, yeah, I, I really like the attention span of a 32-page comic. Right. I oh, like, for sure, yeah. I like reading it and then I'm done right for I and I also like drawing it and then, <laughs> and then you get more more gratification more feedback yeah, more yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just more closure more I, letters, just, you know. I just started to with the 50 pages a year I just started to rewrite stuff because I thought it, that scene was old right right yeah, stuff no one had seen it worked on it you know, long ago, right? you know and it started to really screw with me so I just need that short Cl that closure part. And you can do like you can have pinups again or something. Pinups or, or, or whatever. More comic book. More covers. More back more covers. You know yeah. that that was kind of exciting to do that too, because I just miss drawing co back covers. Back covers. You know. No, that's awesome. Um, well, I'm certainly excited about that. Well, we have a, you know around ten minutes left, so I, you know it would be good to you know open things up to see if there's anybody out here who has any particular questions to ask. Or, anybody. I is it on? Yeah. Hi. Uh, first time I, I read uh, Palomar was when I was living in Europe, first in French, and it didn't really uh, enter. But then I found an, uh, an edition in Spanish made in Spain, mm -hmm. and it felt so weird to read like Luba and all these characters speaking in Iberic uh, uh, Spanish, because uh -huh. at the end they were like Mexican or South American. And my question then will be like, are you going to publish them in Mexico, or if are you gonna have, uh, do you have any relation with Mexican, uh, you know, creators and public? Um, and related to that question too, uh, you often talk about your influences when you were uh, growing up uh, and reading Archie and so on, but uh, do you also have any like Mexican comics influence? I know you hint to uh, Memin Pinguin with some of the <laughs> yeah. uh, Pedro characters. Well, we, uh, you know, there was, it was spotty, you know, um, in American comics uh, I, I noticed 
if if there was a, a Latino as an artist in American comics, they were always really fucking good. It was like Angelo Torres and Al Williamson, who's actually uh, Alonzo Quinones, um, and uh, several other guys. Uh, oh God, the guy uh, Jose Salinas, the guy who did Cisco Kid, and these guys were awesome, you know, and they they did great stuff. But there was only a few of them. And Sergio Aragones, he's working mad from the moment he. He joined Mad in 1961. If you if if you look at the little margin comics that he did from back then, every joke is really good. So he was really good that way. Um, but um, and and we wanted some comics from Mexico as because you know I don't read Spanish, so we, I love the art and I love what was that one comic Pocas Pulgas about the wrestler that you got? <laughs> just stuff that they just wouldn't publish in America. Hey, there was a comic book about a female wrestler, but she's like a housewife, and, and he, he, was, he has uh, copies of it. But what, what got me to it is that he made it very muscular, like her biceps are huge, and you would just never see that in like a fun family comic, you know. And uh, I really love the artwork. He's he's got that, but you just see stuff like that and then I started to see stuff from Europe which is a little more racy and you know from from Spain and you know and you would see that stuff but there was never like I said there was never like a, a total connection it was always just seeing it here and there um, but uh, but no we don't really have any connections to Mexico um, I don't know what the, the publishing world is like there now I know there's a lot of uh, upcoming indie cartoonists coming there lots of uh, you know indie artists are starting to be inspired there. Um, but I, I don't really know. I have to ask our, our publisher. Yeah, I mean, that would be fanners. That yeah. would be their job is to make Their a, job is to connect to those publishers. If a Mexican publisher, you think yeah. that would happen at some point, it probably will. It's yeah. just the stars haven't aligned. I, think, so yeah, I just think it's fine that these are published in Spain. They are translated in Spanish. It, let's get them to those countries. Yeah, right. Let's get them up It'll there. happen. Yeah. So yes. we, it's really interesting to hear you talk about, like, Staying really excited and interesting, interested in the work you're making. Um, <clears throat> I'm nervous. I'm gonna ask a question anyway. Um, so, what are some things that keep you really excited? Like, what sparks your interest in storytelling today? And is punk music still in there in the in the mix? Punk mentality keeps us going. You know, like like I can still do this, and I don't care what you think. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, just uh, for me, for me, it's just my characters um, always have something to say, and I can't wait to get to some of them, you know. And then some of them burn out for a while, and I and I kind of like uh, like go, okay, they'll just go away for for a little bit till I can think of something fresh for them, and then I just go to another character, and I go, well, let me do a story about this one, you know. So it's, I'm always if if I get bored with something, I, there's always something that to take its place. You know, and uh, it just, uh, it's just, and it also it's just something in us that we just get up the next day and continue, you know, and there's, and it's worth it. And I don't know why, <laughs> 35 years later, yeah. but uh, it's, it's just, it's just comics are just cool. It's just yeah. become who we are now. And we've been doing it for so long. I wake up a given morning to do comics, and that's what I do. I don't even second guess it. Maybe I should do something else. You know, I don't. I never think that anymore. It's just part of like eating breakfast and taking a nap. It's drawing comics. That's who we are now. And I just love movies and comics. I just love, especially movies, more than comics. That uh, in, in the sense that I'm always discovering. You know, I thought, you know, when you're a kid, you think you've seen every monster movie, every crime drama, every film drama movie. No, there's always something different and new and wacky and nutty that they've been keeping from you. You know? <laughs> and it wasn't until the 1980s when cable and uh, videotapes came out that right. stuff, they had to fill that space. And so they're just digging from old movies and from different areas and different countries. And I mean, it's, 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 isn't it strange that the Coffin Joe movies didn't show up in America till the 90s? Right. And yet they're made in the early 60s. Right. You know, so you think you know everything and you don't, so there's always discovery. discovery. It's a little more difficult with comics uh, because you do see so much of what has been done. Uh, it's just easier to, you know, at least if for my interests. But anyway, it's just, we just, we just, it's become who we are now. I, I don't see not drawing comics anymore. It's like, well, then that's like not eating or, you know, <laughs> or not drinking. Um, <laughs> which I have to do at a minimum now. That's the curse of getting old. Uh, <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Along the lines of what you are just talking about, uh, a friend of mine is a screenwriter, and he says that you know, he writes seven days a week, 
uh, he sits at the word processor every day, and some days he writes one sentence, other days the pages flow. I'm wondering if you could describe your sort of work habits and how much time you put into it. And uh, sometimes a lot, sometimes never. Just when I'm inspired, you know, I could leave I could leave my comic alone for weeks, and and then remember, oh shoot, I have to finish this thing, <laughs> you know. But it's. Uh, for me, it's just uh, the inspiration has to come. I can't make it come. I've tried. I've tried different ways of making it come, and it will. And the, the real core part of it has to just show up. And I, I've tried tricks to get it there, and I just realize, you know, I can't. Uh, I can't um, make it come. Oh sure, sure, sure. You know, and sometimes it's you're laying it uh, in bed at three in the morning, and you go, "That's what she can do." Yeah, all she had to do was say no instead of yes. Something that simple could just turn over a whole story, you know. And um, so that yeah, that's so that's basically it. Um, there's there's ways of like saving time, like you were saying, you know, oh God, I, I don't have any ideas, so you rule panel borders, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, things like that. But, but yeah, I, I've tried, and it just comes when it comes. Uh, my, the, to avoid writer's block, I usually am working on three things at one time. So if I get stuck on love and rockets, I'll pull out blubber, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, like I'm gonna have companion comics to blubber because blubber can't handle all the stories I want to do, and neither can love and rockets. So I'm trying not to have too many comics, but I, I do. There are things I do want to do in comics that, uh, without the 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 the, the, the pest. Uh, the editor pest at you know ver at Vertigo or whatever you know I just want to do it. But anyway, I usually have three comics at, at, at once, and I'm working on. Them. Sometimes that one of the comics doesn't get finished for a long time because it's just you know it's that one is not the one to do to finish, and uh, and so I'll work on Love and Rockets and another comic usually, to and then I'll end up with a blubber or something. Yeah, he's better at that than I am. But the trouble is, you find yourself working all the time, though. There's never a stopping point. You know, seven days a week for me sometimes. You know, eight day, eight hours a day. You know, so that's why I'm hunched over and old and weird. You know. Do we? We, we, we perhaps time at least for a couple more. I think two more probably. Right, my, One more. My wife and I have had an ongoing argument about you guys. Probably about twenty years. <laughs> uh oh. Um, <laughs> So this will be your, your chance to answer her, because she thinks you're kind of sexist pigs, really. Uh, Which good is for her. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and I point out how all the heroes of your comics are women, and you write very in-depth female characters. And she says, yeah, but they're always sitting around in their underwear. They're obviously, they're just trying to sell these comics. Because women TV don't sit around in their underwear. I know. So <laughs> what do you, I mean, do you see like a dichotomy between writing comics for and about women to sell to teenage boys or well, I, I mean, I can how just, it was in the 80s? Well, I can just tell you for one thing, as the, from the retailer's position, when Love and Rockets came out, women bought comics and came into my store to buy Love and Rockets who had never read comics before. It opened up a huge audience for women you know, who really saw themselves. I heard over and over and over again, women who come in stores like, how do they know? How did they know this is my life? And so, you know, regardless of all those, those are super, people tell, some people react superficially, but I can tell you, I've been in retail, I've been selling their comics since, for 34 years. And, you know, they really, the Love and Rockets, you know, in, you know, brought women into comics, more women into comics than any other comic in the history of the United States. I mean, you know, as far as, uh, you know, this kind of forming, you have Raina Telgemeier, you know, selling millions, but that's, you know, those for kids, but for, you know, mature readers who are looking, you know, for, you know, their lives and, and you know, Love and Rockets, you know, more had, the, you know, the highest percentage of women readers. Mm -hmm. just and, you know, I, I come to shows like this and, uh, I go through the tables, and I see, <laughs> I see a lot of comics that that the women artists are doing, and I'm going, and I'm, I get jealous, like, wow, that's sexy, <laughs> you know, or or like they just will go fur further the sex-wise or whatever, and I'm like, like, God, 
God, but uh, you know, I'm allowed to yell that when I when I do that. You know what? What do you know? The, the analogy I can come up with is that it's if you watch a, a, a film directed by a woman and there's a lot of sex in it and there's a woman that's naked the whole movie, it's fine. Or if a guy, gay guy directs it. But if a, ma a heterosexual guy do it, there's, there's, we've got a problem. You know? So they should just leave the director's name off and see what you think of the, the film. If there's, if there's just an innate prejudice we have. We, we're all insecure. We all have, have you know... I think what happened with Love and Rockets a long way is people kept saying, this is a comic for women, women should read this. Well, that's not, that wasn't the plan. You know, we're just, I'm making underground comics. Mm -hmm. And there's stupid stuff in it and there's intelligent stuff in it. There's just, I'm not um, a focus group, I'm not, you know. So when people come saying, Love and Rockets is supposed to be this, it's no, it's the other way around. It's whatever we feel like doing. So if you don't like it, you don't like it, that's fine. Uh, but um, if you're here that nobody's complaining that the men are so humiliated and ridiculed and blubber, you know, <laughs> nobody's complaining about that. So, right. so there's a lot of uh, prejudice there, you know? No, but it, again, from a retailer perspective, I mean, I know the market of who came into my shop before Love and Rockets and who came after, and after Love and Rockets, you know, women started reading comics, and end of story. I mean, all right, well, thank you very much. I think, you know, we have to call it a day. It's 3 o'clock. <laughs>